There was never a moment in New York where um, we wanted to go to war. That was not the response of New Yorkers. The response of New Yorkers, this is actually well documented, was to go to the library and check out books about Islam to try to figure out what culturally had gone wrong um, that led to this moment. Our number one has been staffed, and our five has been staffed. I am going to call from Washington. I am in a situation where the Americans are learning a possible hijack. What's going on, Betty? The crap is erratic again. Problem is very erratic. Betty, talk to me. Betty, are you there? Betty? Betty? Now, one of our producers said perhaps a second plane was involved. Okay, hold on. The, the people here are, everybody's panicking. All right, well, the that was... exploding right now. You got people running up the street. Okay. Hold on, I'll tell you what's going on. Uh, am the... I still connected? The crash of these two aircraft into the towers of the World Trade Center in New York appear to be an act of terrorism. Good evening. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The search is underway for those who are behind these evil acts. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. Good evening. Good evening and a very warm welcome to the Bali. This evening I will be talking to Mohamedou Old Slai, artist in resident uh, here at the Bali, we're very proud of that, who spent 14 years in Guantanamo Bay, 15 years in prison, uh, and with Larry Seams, who edited Mohamedou's book while he was in prison, Guantanamo Diary. This is a very special evening uh, for many reasons. And one of them is maybe the most uh, special part of it is that it's the first time you two are on stage together uh, talking about uh, your um, a wonderful book, the book you bit, made together. Um, I can recommend it really to everybody to read. It's just, you know, uh, one of the most gripping stories of our time. And it's a great, great pleasure to have you both uh, uh, on the table here. Um, Larry Seams uh, is, among many other things, a human rights activist and a poet and a journalist um, working for the Knights First Amendment Institute in uh, uh, Columbia University <coughs> in New York. Um, Working, have, has been working for the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, writing many uh, uh, reports and stories and books. And Mohamedou, I don't think you need much introduction. Um, I think you're one of the true saints of our time. It's wonderful to have you here tonight. Um, we've been looking at a very short collection of pictures from New York in 9-11. You're a New Yorker. Larry, um, how do you look upon those images? Again, you've probably seen them back over the years, but how do you look upon that? Uh, before I answer, I just want to say thank you, Yuri. Thanks to Dabali. To, to um, it is incredible for me to be sitting here with Mohamedou. Um, we've, we've seen each other, um, but he hasn't been able to come to the United States, so we haven't been able to do programs there. And then, of course, COVID interrupted travel, but um, this is a really emotional um, evening for me for a lot of reasons. And then on top of it, to, to see this footage, um, which I've avoided. You know, I was, I, I, I'm a New Yorker. I was in New York for 9-11. I was very close. Um, my office, uh, I worked at the time for Penn American Center, part of Penn, the International Writers Organization, and our office was on Broadway and Soho and about, about a mile straight down Broadway to the towers. 
Um, like many New Yorkers, the planes hit while I was on my way to the office, um, and inexplicably, most of us continued to go to the office, even after we realized that there was a second plane, that it was probably a coordinated attack, but we, you know, I think as a kind of denial mechanism, we went to the office, and when I got to the office, I had a young colleague, um, and her boyfriend uh, was sitting outside of the office door. He, works, he worked at Morgan Stanley in, the, in, the, in, in one of the towers, and they, they were in the second tower that was hit. Um, when the plane hit the first tower, he was on the 34th floor, and they evacuated. They ordered that tower evacuated, and he came down the stairs, and he got down to about the 17th floor, and then they issued an all clear and said, there's no threat, you can go back. And almost all of his colleagues climbed, you know, went back to their office, but he wouldn't. He came to be with his girlfriend, and so he was sitting outside my office. Um, I was in the office. The shot of the towers falling was what I saw from our office window. Um, I was one of those people who walked across the bridge um, back to Brooklyn um, to pick up my son at school, uh, a school where three parents of children in the school were died that day and were at work, and every single firefighter in our neighborhood firehouse was killed. So it was, um, I have really, really avoided looking at those images. Um, but there's something really, I think it's really important um, to say this because I don't think it gets talked about enough was the difference in reaction from people who lived in New York and people who lived outside of New York. Um, there was never a moment in New York where um, we wanted to go to war. That was not the response of New Yorkers. The response of New Yorkers, this is actually well documented, was to go to the library and check out books about Islam to try to figure out what culturally had gone wrong um, that led to this moment. That was a very typical New York reaction to what happened. Um, our expectation, you know, you saw George Bush saying, you know, they're gonna use all the tools of law enforcement and intelligence to bring these people to justice. America had a choice at that moment. They could have um, treated this as a criminal matter. Oh, thank you. As a criminal matter and, and you know, gone through Interpol and brought people to justice <coughs> trial in New York. Everybody in New York would have welcomed that, you know? Um, or we could have done this military response, which was in George Bush's second part of that, which he says, we'll make no distinction between those who did this and those who harbored them, you know? And that was just a truly fatal mistake. Nobody in New York would have asked for that. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, it's so important for people to understand what the experience was to be there. You know, it's horrifically traumatic to, to look at those images. But the reaction to that is not, um, is not in, in line with what the United States did in response. I'm so glad you're picking out, you know, the short George Bush um, clip we put in, of course, because, um, because um, it's from that moment onward um, <coughs> that um, um, the reaction came, uh, build, what the build-up came, and uh, something completely went out of joint, of course. Um, something really went wrong. And um, one of the things which went wrong was that um, uh, people were arrested who uh, had no uh, guilt at all, and um, one of them was Mohammed Ould Sly. <laughs> Mohammed was you. So um, when did you first realize that this story was uh, pinned upon you? Uh, <clears throat> so wrongly, we have to say. With it. <laughs> uh, thank you, Yuri. You know, uh, and I think every and each one of you guys. I just want to shout every and each one of you guys' name. And uh, this is I just want to tell you because I know you came here because you love me and you love Larry. That I found a home here. And uh, thank you, Yuri. Ah, uh, okay. I can shout too, by the way. <laughs> then the viewers at home will not be able to hear. Ah, uh, okay. So, yeah, it's better like this. Yeah, thank you. I, I was saying that I really like tea. <clears throat> the tea was good, that's what I was saying. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and uh, I'm just really very, uh, I'm very overwhelmed with happiness, you know, and... Uh, it's very hard to explain to people the meaning of freedom if they never lost freedom. 
it's just impossible, just like the concept of hot and cold can only understood uh, when, uh, when we compare the two. And if you never know what's hot, you would never know what's cold and vice versa. And I vividly remember the day, just like he, you know, on the other side of the Atlantic, I was setting up servers, Linux server for a German organization. And that was bad omen, why should I help the Germans? <laughs> <clears throat> so I was setting up their servers and uh, I was uh, really like completely into my work. It was about, I think, 2 p.m. Mauritanian time, GMT. And, you know, I was like installing and then this guy came to me and said, Mohammed, World War Three." Hmm. I said, what? And then he told me, you know, there is like an attack against the U.S. and so And then I didn't pay much attention because I was too worried about my war. And when I came back, I had lunch with Ibrahim, Dr. Ibrahim, you met him. I did, yeah. And uh, everywhere on TV, you know, there was those uh, horrific images of uh, uh, senseless killing. And a couple of weeks, I was picked up. So. I know, like, my parents already knew that I was already under the microscope, under the radar of the intelligence, because I was kidnapped from Dakar. They take, took away my passport, and they forbade me to leave the country. And uh, I remember when the cops came to my home, Mukhabarat. Even the name is scary, <laughs> you know, Mukhabarat. And, uh, it's a secret service, huh? the Mauritanian secret service, Mauritanian yes. secret service. Yes. yeah. Secret service. And uh, <clears throat> they came to me and then they said, we want you to come with us. So I was only with my mom. And I remember because I came back, also I was installing service in, in the presidency. And uh, they said, we need you to come with us. So this is not the Netherlands where they tell you, we arrest you in the name of the law, and this is the charge. No charge, nothing. He just like received a call from the U.S., probably the U.S. Embassy, they pick him up. No question asked. Just like the president said that, you know, if uh, you're harboring them, you know. And uh, I was taken away, you know. I remember, the, I remember this image that seared in my brain of my mother holding her tasbih, pray beads, like frantically, you know, like as if she thinks that if she prays quicker, that the pray, prayers would be answered, you know. Quicker. Yeah. Quicker, you yeah. know. Yeah. And she just disappeared when we turned right. And uh, I remember when they came to me many years later on, telling me that she died, she passed on. I, I, I couldn't, like the pain was so bad that I just had to punish my body. I stood up and started reciting the Quran. I think it took me 10 hours to finish the whole book. And then I was like completely done. And then I collapsed. And as if that's not enough, they came back to me and said, your brother died too. <laughs> I was like, okay. And then I have this like, you know, Orenzausen, you know, like mm -hmm. this ringing my ears were ringing. I couldn't hear. They were talking, moving their lips. Mm. But I didn't hear what they were saying. I only heard your brother die. That's it. And they, they, then they brought me a priest from Sudan because they kicked out the imam. Because they said the imam was conspiring. You know him. He's from your city. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And they said the Imam was conspiring because he's a Muslim, he's American, but he's a Muslim. So they brought me this priest and he started reading from the Bible. And then I was like, and then I only like, and he was telling me how I should be a good believer and so everything. And I didn't say anything. I just was listening and, and then they left. So I do believe that after those pictures, one of the biggest casualties of 9-11 is democracy and the rule of law. 
they were they took a very big hit and i'm from a region where people still are trying to enjoy the same kind of freedom that you enjoy here you take for granted and after 9 11 this was like out of the window because they say if the united states of america can do all of this we don't need to uh, respect the rule of law it was like a god sent to the dictatorial regime human rights violated everywhere now and china is it's just laughable that the united states of america is telling chinese uh, chinese government you cannot put the uyghur in detention camp they said you do it to the muslims why shouldn't we do it to the muslim muslims are bad people you know <clears throat> right mm -hmm. we um we, 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 we come back to this topic um, a lot, I hope, this evening. Um, we asked um, a famous actor, Jochem ten Haaf, to read a fragment from the book you both um, have been uh, um, writing. And uh, he will read out a short part of, a short part of it. And we, we have other fragments uh, later on in the conversation we might want to use. But uh, let's listen for a moment to the book. A person was undoing the chains on my wrists. He undid the first hand and another guy grabbed that hand and bent it while a third person was putting on the new, firmer and heavier shackles. Now my hands were shackled in front of me. Somebody started to rip my clothes with something like a scissors. And I was like, what the heck is going on? I started to worry about the trip I neither wanted nor initiated. Somebody else was deciding everything for me. I had all the worries in the world but making a decision. And many thoughts went quickly through my head. The optimistic thoughts suggested, maybe, maybe you're in the hands of Americans, but don't worry, they just want to take you home and make sure that everything goes in secrecy. The pessimistic ones went, you screwed up. The Americans managed to pin some shit on you and they're taking you to US prisons for the rest of your life. I was stripped naked. It was humiliating. But the blindfold helped me miss the nasty look of my naked body. During the whole procedure, the only prayer I could remember was the crisis prayer. Ya hayu, ya kayum. And I was mumbling it all the time. Whenever I came to be in a similar situation, I would forget all my prayers except a crisis prayer, which I learned from the life of our prophet, peace be upon him. Then one of the team wrapped a diaper around my private parts. And only then was I dead sure that the plane was heading to the United States. Now I start to convince myself that everything is going to be all right. My only worry was about my family seeing me on TV in such a degrading situation. I was so skinny. I've always been, but never that skinny. My street clothes had become so loose that I looked like a small cat in a big bag. When the US team finished putting me in clothes they tailored for me, a guy removed my blindfold for just a moment. I couldn't see much because he directed the flashlight right into my eyes. He was wrapped from hair to toe in a black uniform. He opened his mouth and stuck out his tongue, gesturing for me to do the same, a kind of AHH test, which I took without resistance. I saw part of his very pale, blonde-haired arm, which cemented my theory of being in Uncle Sam's hands. Thank you, Jochem Ten Haaf. Thank you. Um, this was after you've been in Syria imprisoned and been taken to Guantanamo Bay. Um, then it took another 14 years to get out. Did you thought originally that this would be brief or that it would be long or that you would be killed? Or what, what sort of expectations that you had when you were going to that 
dark hole. Can you rem remember that? So <clears throat> we have a saying in Arabic. I don't know whether we have a similar one in uh, the Netherlands. The last part in us that dies is hope. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So funny, yeah, <clears throat> we, we have the same, I think, in English as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, in Dutch. Yeah. I can claim that this is in a very old Arabic book. <laughs> 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 if that's of any help for my arguments. <clears throat> uh, so I, every situation, I always said, ah, okay, I accept this, but it's not going to be as bad, really, as I uh -huh. th think so. This is, because if you don't have hope, you're dead. So there is, we only live uh, uh, on hope. So it's like the gas, the fuel. And uh, I just want to mention here mm -hmm. something that's very important for, because I could see that uh, the audience has people from, with backgrounds from the Middle East and West Africa. Mm -hmm. Without the Arab regimes and Guantanamo Bay wouldn't have happened because they would send us to Arabic countries for torture. Arabic countries would provide uh, false or unverified intelligence to the American to kidnap, help kidnap their people. So I am mostly angry, and I keep saying this at my government and the Arab governments because it's their job to protect their citizens. And uh, I'm saying this with a lot of pain in my heart. And uh, uh, so when they stripped me naked, I knew that I would, would never go back. And this was like a revelation to me. And then when I start to regret all the things, the bad things I did in my life. And I will tell you what I didn't regret, for instance. I did not regret not having money. I did not regret you know, not having like uh, an apartment in Saint Kemar on this small party. I did not regret so many beautiful women that they never wanted me. <laughs> and I was so frustrated. I did not, they did not mean anything to me at that. But one thing meant everything to me. Every time I made bad comment to anyone I love, anyone like my mother, my sisters, my partner, my brothers, my friends, and I vowed from that moment, a vow of kindness that I will always be kind, no matter what, every day. And, uh, and it's just like, you know, it's just like I was given another life, you know. Did you know, Larry, that um, America was locking up people without trial? Well, I knew it because, in fact, it's interesting because just this week, um, the federal government settled a lawsuit that was brought by six Muslim, ma Muslim American men from Brooklyn, from my neighborhood, um, who were among thousands of Americans who were rounded up um, in, in the U.S. in the days and weeks after the attack and spent several weeks and sometimes months in prison without charge, in, um, sometimes in immigration prison, sometimes in um, the... Metropolitan Detention Center, and these men brought a lawsuit for the treatment that they had received, and just this week, the federal government finally settled with those six men. So, yes, I knew. I knew that there was a... Um, this week, this actual week. This actual week, yeah. That, that took a long time. 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, and and for a, a, a paltry sum of money, I yeah. should say. Yeah. They are. yeah, but you were aware of it already then it was happening literally it was happening in my neighborhood mm -hmm. you know i mean you know there's the, the brooklyn is very diverse and and you know the people who um the the the, the arab american community the yemeni community in particular yemeni american um own a lot of the corner grocery stores in uh, the bodegas in in brooklyn and many of them had employees who were taken away um in those days so yes there, there was that sense mm -hmm. um uh and, you know, and, and eventually, I mean, when Guantanamo opened, which was, you know, in, in January of 2022, we, you know, the war in Afghanistan was going on. There were prisoners from there. Um, so, yes, Guantanamo, you, you know, you knew at that point that people were, you know, hundreds of men were being held in Guantanamo. I mean, it's interesting, Mohamedou, you know, m mentions the, 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 the reaction in, in Mauritania. Um, 
and and the role of of Arab dictators and and whatnot. But you know, it, it, the country of Jordan, where Mohammedu was held, you know, the, we asked Jordan in the early days of the detention to to take men, and Mohammedu was one of, I think, 17 men who were held at the. Um, we as the United States. United Army. States. Yeah. Yeah. The United States government. It's very um, nice of you that you say we, but. As Americans, yeah, but not you. No, I mean, <laughs> how is it not me? How is it? Well, no, okay, that's an in, that's an important that's an important uh, uh, notion. But, yeah. but 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I didn't personally. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, but mm -hmm. um, uh, but the Jordanians refused essentially refused to torture Mohammedu, and not only that, but they they also knew that Mohammedu was innocent. So the book, the beginning of the book, that scene, which is the is the scene where. Mohamedou believed that he was being sent home from Mauritania, that the Jordanians had cleared him. There was a plane coming for him. He believed that he was going to get sent home. And instead, this rendition crew from the United States comes and cuts off his clothes, puts him in you know, a diaper and, and, and earmuffs, and sends him to Bagram Air Base, where we hold him for three weeks and then send him to Guantanamo. And as that's happening, you know, because Jordan and other Middle East dictatorships would not, refused ultimately to play that role, that's when the U.S. started to open up its own secret detention facilities. We, you know, Guantanamo, which was public um, to some extent, but where what happened to Mohammedu was a deep secret within Guantanamo. Meanwhile, the CIA was opening up these secret prisons, which we now know. Um, the first one was in Thailand, in Poland, in Lithuania, and these places which were completely secret. And you know, part of Mohamedou's, the, the, the story around Mohamedou is essentially wrapped up with secrecy and censorship. You know, it's, it, it's um, to do what we did to Mohamedou, what the United States did to Mohamedou, I should get in the habit of being more careful about that. Um, you, you can say whatever you like, I like <laughs> no, to point no, out. Yeah, 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 yeah that, that's but, interesting. Yeah. But and I, I will say we, I will no. say we, um, because it was, it, 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 again, that was part of that sense of, you know, to watch what America was doing after 9-11, after having that experience in New York, you know, it was a, a sense of, you know, these are, these are my brothers, my people, I mean, sisters who are making these decisions. How are they, how are they doing this? But, but um, uh, so, if, you know, these secret prisons were, were being opened and they were being opened specifically to torture people because you can't torture people in public because it's an international human rights crime that's, uh, you know, codified in international law. It's codified in U.S. law. If, you, if somebody tortures, they must be brought to justice. If somebody is tortured, they must be re re there must be reparations. They must be made whole. This is the Convention Against Torture. It's U.S. law. So it, could not, it cannot happen. It's very important that you pointed out that the reason for the secrecy is the fact that they wanted to torture people. Absolutely. It was, and it's, absolutely. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's, um, what do they because call it in law? So, mens mens so, rea, right? It's not so obvious to... to yeah. Yeah. No. But, 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 but it is. It's, it's criminal it's, intent. Yeah, it's criminal, it's that's criminal right. intent. Yeah. 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 Um, that, was, that was the reason for the secrecy to begin with. But the more horrifying part of the censorship story is that by 2004 mm. or 2005, when Mohamedou wrote this remarkable manuscript in Guantanamo, the United States knew perfectly well that any of its suspicions were unfounded. You know? But Mohamedou was held for another 10 years in Guantanamo. His manuscript was kept classified and locked up in a warehouse in a secret facility outside of Washington, D.C. for seven more years. Why? Simply to suppress the story. Guantanamo is open today for no, no national security purpose whatsoever. The 39 men who are there now, you know, some of them could have been tried, should have been tried in criminal courts in the United States um, for actual involvement with the 9-11. They'll probably, they may never be tried um, because they'll be so tainted their, their cases by torturing them uh, so badly. Um, but the secrecy, Guantanamo remains open today for one reason. It's just like a file cabinet for secrets. You know, um, They finally had to let Mohammed go because the book was out. You know, the information was public. But the information, I'm, I have to be very clear about this, the information about what happened to him was public long before the book was published. I knew about Mohamedou's story because I had been working on this book project with the ACLU. As Yuri said, the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, had filed Freedom of Information Act um, litigation and won the release of 140,000 pages of government documents about prisoner abuse in Guantanamo, Afghanistan, and Iraq. 
And, you know, I worked with them. There was a, a challenge to get the public to engage with 140,000 pages. How do you do that? So, you know, I, I was brought in as a writer to kind of try to piece together stories from these very fragmentary, very redacted, very censored documents. Well, one of the stories that comes through clearest in all of the government's documents is what happened to Mohamedou. Mohamedou was one of the most tortured people in Guantanamo. For some really weird reason, throughout history, torturers have kept fanatically uh, meticulous records of torture. Every time a torturing regime falls, you'll find, they find an archive. You know, you, th you think of the Stasi, you think of the, the government of Argentina, the government of Brazil. You know, why do they do it? I think they do it because if you're torturing and you keep a record, it's a way of showing that you're in a chain of command, right? You're doing, you're just following orders. So Mohamedou's case was, was well documented. He, there, the United States Senate had a report about what happened in Guantanamo, the prisoner abuse in Guantanamo. There are six pages of that report that summarize secret documents for, like Mohamedou's daily interrogation law. So everything that Mohamedou describes very gently, I should say, very, very gently in Guantanamo Diary is in those, is in, was in those documents since 2008. So, you know, but the, the public didn't engage with it. But once that, once Mohamedou's voice was out there, there was no reason to keep him in detention. So he was released within a year and a half after the book was published. But it was just like, you know, so censorship existed in order to be able to torture. Like you say, it was just, you know, to, to, to commit the crime, it had to happen in secret. And then it remains, to this day, no journalist has been able to speak to a Guantanamo prisoner. I had no contact with Mohamedou while the book was, while I was working on the manuscript. I asked the US government when I had submitted the final edit to the publishers, I said, can I meet with him once? Because I believe it's the right of every writer to have final approval about how their words appear in print, and they refused that meeting. Um, mm -hmm. But that system, that system of censorship and secrecy as it's existed for the last 10 or 15 years has been simply to prevent accountability. I think it's very, among the many things you said, there's uh, 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 an important thing, the relationship between secrecy, intent, and torture, um, which is still not very sort of blatantly obvious, although, you know, the way you explain it to us, it's very obvious. There's intent in it. So in that respect, um, um, you said we, um, you pointed to the uh, uh, Syrian government. Uh, um, Mohammed, who said, you know, the, the Arabic governments are um, uh, also uh, responsible for the fact that, that Guantanamo happened. And we have to add to that, that the Europeans and the Dutch government and the Dutch, and we are as well. We were part of the special rendition. You, you're mentioning Lithuania and Poland. People were flown from different places in the earth to other places in secrecy to be tortured. So if we talk about we, I think we should include the we as the Dutch, although Mohammed was very um, uh, 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 friendly about the Dutch rule of law. We have to point out that you know, there is also a flaw in, in, in the Dutch system. So it's important to, to be clear about those sort of things. Um, then um, you just said that the 9-11 terrorists were able to give a huge blow to the rule of law, to the idea of democracy, and that they were uh, very successful in, in, in doing that. Um, let's take a short look at one of the people, um, uh, uh, a little bit of footage of Donald Rumsfeld, <laughs> and continue our conversation. There are reports that there is no evidence of a direct link between Baghdad and some of these terrorist organizations. There are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. <laughs> Excuse me, but is this an unknown unknown? Uh, I'm not several unknowns, and I'm, I'm just I'm not going. I'm not unknown. going to say which it is. Um, we took this fragment, of course, because we're talking about rule of law, we're talking about democracy, we're talking about you know how the world went out of joint, um, and how it's been um, 
Uh, and I think one of the coolest parts, actually, is the laughing right. uh, uh, around it. Because what he says is actually that uh, we have unknown unknowns and therefore we need torture. That's his reasoning. And once people in power of big nations, you know, have these sort of things, and actually the journalists around it, you know, think it's funny, it becomes really scary, of course. Right. <laughs> right. Well, Mohamedou, I mean, Mohamedou mentioned um, uh, the, the, the reaction of dictators in the Arab world was mm -hmm. to double down on repression, right? And I think one of the reasons that I got involved in this story was, um, you know, I'd been a journalist and, and human rights advocate, and Penn is an international human rights advocacy organization, and I spent a lot of time, you know, I would go to other countries where writers were being held in prison for what they had written. Um, and Penn was one of a number of organizations where people in my position very quickly learned that the ground had shifted, right? Our ability to protest or, you know, make a, 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 a proactive, effective case on behalf of a writer who was being held in, I remember Ethiopia, there was an enormous press crackdown, Eritrea, China had an enormous crackdown a month after 9-11. You know, and, 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 and a Western human rights worker to go to those countries, you know, in those days to say this, you know, the, the, the reaction was to have, they would laugh in your face. They would laugh in your face. So, you know, one of the, you know, we were an organization that thought a lot about international advocacy, and like many human rights workers in the United States, we immediately had to take stock of the situation at home and think about, you know, what was happening in the U.S. And, and because Penn's work was specifically focused on censorship and free expression, you know, this aspect of the story was that there was, you know, secrecy, which was an essential tool of the war on terror, was an integral part of the violence that was being done. Um, made, I think, you know, the, 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 the job of excavating these documents and hearing these voices, you know, more and more important. Um, and, you know, it was this great work of lawyers who, you know, who got these documents released. Um, and then ultimately the, you know, the incredible, um, uh, you know, the incredible manuscript that Mohamedou produced, which was, you know, written in this, you know, in Mohamedou's voice, which was a, 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 a deeply humane, compassionate, empathetic voice you know, in the middle of all this. At Penn, I had seen many prison memoirs. The first thing any writer does when they go to jail is write a memoir and then when they're in prison. So, you know, they're, they're a dime a dozen, I, I promise you, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, you can bet if you hear about a poet in prison, they write, they're writing a book about it, you know. Um, I'd seen many of them. And so when I got Mohammadi's manuscript, I, I, you know, I knew that this was important because I knew, that, like I said, I knew the story of what happened to him, you know. But I, 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 I got it on a CD-ROM and I took it home and I put it in my computer and I printed out the 466 pages. And I sat down on my couch with this sense of dread you know, just like, this is going to be hard. It's going to be, you know, painful. Um, it's going to be often unreadable, you know, and I'm going to have to decide what to do with this. And I sat down and I read it from beginning to end without getting up. And I laughed out loud um, sometimes. Um, I, I, I was amazed by Mohamedou's insistence that he would not um, depersonalize uh, and anonymize and erase the identities of the Americans who were he was in contact, but he would treat them with the uh, the respect that, that they were individual people with individual motivations. Every single one of them. Um, that you know that's why Mohammedu was was that, that's why the book was suppressed and that's why Mohammedu was suppressed because it is a uh, a, a, a living uh, negation of the. The, the attempt to extinguish humanity, um, Mohamedou's humanity. And he answered that with this incredibly humane um, and, 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 and deeply literary uh, composition. So, you know, it was, it, for me, I was given this opportunity of a lifetime to, you know, deal with the human rights questions that I dealt with, with the censorship questions that I dealt with, with the literary um, you know, the, the uh, just love of literature, you know, just that the, the, what literature does that nothing else can do. Um, and so, you know, that, I, I, it was an entirely different experience when it, that, I expect, that I expected, and, and um, uh, I, I, yeah, it was remarkable. Mm -hmm. 
It became a re remarkable book. I can imagine, I can Im I totally imagine what you're, what you're saying. Uh, uh, the book is gripping and you're putting it in a very wonderful way how sort of the literary answer of giving humanity back to treatment which was inhumane. And that's very special. Um, um, Mohamedou, can you um, tell us a little bit out about how you wrote this? I mean, the circumstances or the, <laughs> the process, or, I mean, I can't, you know, I can't even start to imagine. And we've seen uh, just a few pictures of, of, of the manuscript you were reading uh, through, you just referred to. But, but I mean, how did you do it? It's your fourth language. <laughs> it's, you've written it in English. Uh, here you see the pages suppressed by censorship, but... Um, uh, <clears throat> yes, I wrote it in English because I didn't want to leave uh, uh, a lot of room to interpretation because, uh -huh. like, when the Danish sent letters, when I sent letters in Arabic to my family who doesn't speak English, they stay very long time because every Arabic word to them could mean like a, <clears throat> um, a code. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and I went through a process. So, you know, I really want the world, especially my family, to know that I'm not an evil person. I mean, every day they took me to interrogation. They say you are evil, and to be honest, I believed them. After a while, you did. Yes, after a while, I did, and I had so bad uh, nightmares every night. One time, they took me to this room. Uh, I remember this was uh, Michael Michael uh, Bush, his FBI interrogator. He interrogated me in Mauritania too, and. Um, uh, Robert, Robert uh, Sidlow, and Chris, I don't know his last name, three interrogators, FBI. And then I was like a stone because I didn't have a lawyer back then, but you know, my time in Germany taught me that I don't have to talk to the police before they provide me with you know, my charge. I kept saying, you tell me what I did and I talk to you and no talk. I was just like a stone. They come to me every day. That would change when they torture me. But before they heavily torture me, I refused to say anything. You tell me why you brought me here, and I would talk to you. You don't tell me, no talk. And they brought me to this room, took me to this room. They put all the dead people of 9-11. They filled the room with dead bodies. And so I need to maintain my dignity and not talk. But I was really kaput. So, and then after the whole night, just showing me pictures of dead people, they took me to my room. And well, they showed the pictures too. Just showing me pictures. They said, you killed mm -hmm. those people. You are responsible for every and each one of them. Mm -hmm. One after the other, one after the other, one after. And I couldn't sleep. I had so much pain. So. So I wanted to tell my family, I didn't do any of this. I want to tell the world. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't allowed to have a pen or paper because I was considered a bad person. So, and, but they would give other detainees like papers and pens because allowing them to write letters to their family. Mm -hmm. We also have thou shall not steal, but nothing says shall not borrow. Mm -hmm. So I figured I figured I could borrow it yeah. for so, good purpose. Yeah. Yeah, and then so and then I would take and they would the tennis would pass me through the um, you know it's like very small, like this cell. Very small. Yeah, if you look at the the, the movie the Mauritanian we talked that yeah, last you see the full, very small. Very small. So, yeah. They would pass me and then I would write 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 very quickly write write and then give it back. Then I wrote in French, German, and Arabic, and very little English because my English was really very bad. And, uh, and then I hide it. Could you hide it in the small cell? Yes, you put it like 
next time you go to prison, come to me. <laughs> I teach you everything. <laughs> Seriously, I know all the tricks. You know, today, I said, I know this looks bad on you, but I could commit the perfect crime. <laughs> well, that's how bad prisons are. So, and I would hide it. So there are many places you can hide stuff. So you could like open the, the, uh, the mattress, you could open it a little bit and then put the papers inside it, everything, and then just close it again. But when they come, when they really, uh, when they really want to like uh, search it, which, which they did, when they decided, this guy who spoke uh, Ramsfeld, when he decided I should be tortured, they came to me. They took me. It was his personal decision and personal signature. That's yes. also a reason for us to show. And yeah. that put a stop. I remember the day they came to me. And uh, they have rubber gloves. Rubber gloves, you know, like doctors? Mm -hmm. You know, doctors, rubber gloves, so. And they came to me and it says here, India. It says, India, okay. Uh, I think 24, India 24, I think. It says India 24. And then they came to me, they said, detain you, move. And, uh, and I say, like, where? This is none of your business. Then I was even more scared because usually they tell you we moving you from this block to this. I was in mic, and then people could see that my face was so white. I was so scared, you know. And then one Yemeni said, "Oh, don't lose your faith in Allah. Allah is with you." I was like, "Shut the fuck up." <laughs> <laughs> You, they're not taking you, they're taking me. <laughs> Why don't you tell them your faith is better than mine, they could take you? His name is uh, Walid. You know, he, he was really very badly injured because he was bombarded. And, uh, and just mentioning the other detainees, I want you to understand that I am privileged to be here. Mm. Privileged to be here because I survived. Gur Rahman did not survive the cold room. He died in the cold room, I described in my book. Dali Ward did not survive the beating. He died from the beating. Because the problem with the beating, uh, in my experience, that you cannot breathe. Because they, they, they hit you on your rib cage, and you cannot breathe anymore. And then you just die, you can die very quickly. And it's so amazing that those people are not doctors. They don't know how vulnerable we human beings are, you know. And those people died, so I'm privileged to talk to you. So they took me, and then they took all my writing. And then nothing. They, every last one, they just like uh, took me in my uniform, and then they put me in India. By the way, India block is where the torture begins. It's very infamous block called India. I don't know why they call it India. I don't want to make any comment. <laughs> so, and uh, yeah, they took me there. So, and then I stopped writing because I felt so violated. Those are my intimate thinking, you know, and they take my intimate thinking, you know, from me. And then I stopped until much later, 2005, when the lawyer, they came to me, they said, your lawyer is coming. It was June, 2005, and then, they, they told me you can write also on paper. And then I just went writing, writing, writing. I think in one day I wrote 160 pages. Yes. You know, and then came to them because I was so happy. I said, this is America. I, I used to watch Law and Order. <laughs> I said, this is like, they will give me like millions of dollars. <laughs> I was in for a very, very big surprise, by the way. And then I used to watch also Married with Children. Anyone know? Shrek Lishneta family, anyone? <laughs> <laughs> married so, with children. Yeah, I think yeah, married with children. As well. yeah. So I said, this is America, fun and law and order. That's why I wrote so quickly, because <laughs> I want the box, you know? <laughs> but but the, 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 the first notes you wrote down before the prolonged torture, did they ever give it back to you? Uh, no, they, they took everything. And then you never saw it back? They took also, uh, uh, they, they gave me back fragments, but that's not the only thing they took, because I ended up uh, writing uh, uh, 
uh, other manuscript like uh, Portable Happiness and Ahmed in Deutschland is about uh, uh, those young people. Yeah, I wrote about them behind their backs. <laughs> you know, the young uh, European with foreign backgrounds mm -hmm. because they couldn't, they are not fully accepted in their countries. And then they go back to Morocco. Moroccan also don't accept them no. because they don't speak the language. They don't know the manners. And I used to hang out with them a lot and I consider myself one of them. So I wrote about them, uh, the confusion, you know, they took that away. They never gave it back to me. And they took also the awful English language. <laughs> so uh, a book I wrote about, a manuscript I wrote about, you know, uh, responding to Mark Twain, the awful German language. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. Mark Twain, yeah. Mark Twain, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. I read it and I was very upset, you know, <laughs> because he just is not aware of how awful the English language is. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, that was the story. But then you were allowed to write? Yes. And then you said 160 pages in one day and it's... Uh, in, one, in, in, one, in one, I think one or two days, and then I gave it to Nancy. And then she read, she said, Mohammed, you need to write more. Nancy Hollander. Um, Nancy Hollander. Yeah, she will be here in the autumn with you in the same sort of conversation, the lawyer um, who represented you. Yeah. So, yes, and I yeah. urge all the young lawyers here to come also to meet her. Mm -hmm. But she said to you, write more. You need more. to keep writing. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, oh, OK. And I still have something that I want to write because it was like in a hurry. I wrote in a hurry. And then I sat there and then start to write from the beginning. And then in two and a half months, I wrote everything. And then I used to send to her in, smuggled into very small, very small writing. If you see this writing, it's very small. And I write on both sides. And then one time, you know, one of my lawyer, her colleague, uh, Sylvia, she came to me, said, she was very upset. Why do you write on both sides of the? I paper. was laughing so hard. <laughs> she said, why are you laughing? I said, I don't have paper. That's why. <laughs> you know, because Americans hate when you write on both sides of them. So do not write on it when you go to America. So. And yeah, that's how. And then I sent it. And then, like Larry told you, when, and I just want the people here in this beautiful country to understand that we have lawyers, but those lawyers don't have rights as the lawyer in this country because... You mean we in Mauritania have lawyers or...? I mean in, <coughs> in, in the Netherlands. Uh -huh. So if you have a lawyer, you can communicate like privately with the lawyer. Yeah. As a Guantanamo team, you cannot communicate privately with no. the lawyer. So anything I write, it has to go to privileged team. Privileged team is the US government. Yeah. So, and they look at it. So, and if you say, okay, I want to take this home, they say, let me first read it. And then they read it. They read my, my, my manuscript and said, no way. It's not going from here. And it was a fight for more than seven years, seven, seven and a half years. You know, until they, my book was detained just like me. You know. Mm -hmm. Just to avoid embarrassment, nothing more. So there's this... Um strange thing with the manuscript, there are many strange things, but one of them is, um, like Larry just pointed out, um, you were maybe also kept in prison because you wrote it. Because they knew you wrote it, it's there, it was in their files, they couldn't destroy it probably, well they could have maybe, but that would have been awkward, or outlawed, or, but it was there, so um, how do you look upon that? Because also it set you free in the end when it came out. So are you, it took years and years and years and years to get out. Um, how do you look upon the book in that respect? I mean, is it something which set you, helped to set you free or prolong? I mean, it must be very double in many ways because you decided to write it in 2005 and were encouraged by Nancy Hollander and how do you, Look upon those. I mean, it's two things at the same time. Yeah, uh, precisely. So, you know, we are a story. 
We are a story. We ourselves. As human people, beings. As human beings, yes. As human beings. Yeah. When we go into a social setting, mm -hmm. everybody wants to tell people what they did. Yeah. So I did, so I, I bought these at, mm -hmm. because they want to be acknowledged. Yeah. And we are just a story. And if your story, if you are not allowed to tell your story, you don't exist anymore. You are not being allowed to exist. And uh, mm -hmm. you see this among all detainees. And this shocked the lawyers because my lawyers think, for instance, and it's very logical that my first priority is to go home. That's not my first priority. My first priority is my story to be known. That's my first priority. Uh, one, the oldest detainee, Paracha, he went to the board before me. And we had the same personal representative, Jackson, uh, Command Jackson. You know, a personal representative is a lawyer that is appointed by the government to help you put together your file. That's how it works. Mm. And uh, he came back to me and he said he's very upset because, because they wouldn't accept Paracha, they wouldn't release him. And I was very scared. It was like one or two weeks before. And I said, why? He, they said, they asked him a question and they said, what are you going to do? He was like, I'm going back to my job. His job was like a TV producer, you know. That's his whole life. And then the guy said, aren't you considering retirement? This was a hint for him to say, I'm not going to do anything. Like, I'm not going to work. He said he was very upset. Like, you want to kill me? You want me to go and die? I'm going back to my job. And then they refused him completely. Mm -hmm. And you see that over and over. Detainees always want to say, this is my story. And they don't allow them to tell their story. You know? So me, I remember the day that I saw, I saw my, the book when it was published by Larry. I didn't know. I don't know what's going on because I'm in a prison. You, did, you didn't know. You didn't and know I was not good. allowed to have this book. I was not allowed to have a copy when it mm -hmm. was re released. No copy. And then I saw on TV, I was in a Spanish lesson. <laughs> I took Spanish lesson because I wanted to fit in. <laughs> because in Guantanamo Bay. In Guantanamo Bay. And uh, my teacher was Ahmed. He's from Egypt, <laughs> teaching a Mauritanian Spanish. In, in, that in story Cuba. in Cuba. In Cuba. In Cuba. <laughs> that story, and he does not speak Spanish, by the way. So that story you cannot make up. <laughs> and so, and we we sat in the class, and I was shackled to the floor, you know, just like you see in the movie. And then the TV, it was RT. First, first news, me with the book, my, just my photo. And then if he was looking like, who is this guy, who is this guy? I was like, I don't know him. <laughs> you know, I don't know anyone, you know that. So. <laughs> and, uh, and I felt like freedom. You know, honestly, I can tell you this much, that you can feel freedom inside a cell. And you can feel freedom, or you can feel like bondage when you are at your home. When you hate, you are in prison. When you are intolerant, you are in prison because no one will free you because you, you, your prison is you, yourself. And then when I, I, I went outside, was walking, singing, and I was in isolation, absolute isolation. I cannot see anyone, you know, but that my story was out there that people would talk about me and they know I'm innocent was really big, you know. I, I remember this day that it, it, we, we had, the, pub, the book was published simultaneously in the U.S. and, and, and the U.K. And the, there was an event in the U.K. where the public event was, was, was in London. And I went and Nancy Hollander and I were, you know, going to do this public event with the, with the British publisher. And we did a round of press around that. And one of, the, one of the places that she insisted that we do was an interview with RT. 
And I had stopped. RT is Russia Today. Yeah, Russia, Russia Today. Yes. And I had stopped doing interviews with Russia Today um, because. For good reasons. Yeah. For good reasons. I mean, yeah. it, this had been after the invasion of Crimea. I went, I remember I did one, you know, after the, after the torture report was published, and I went, um, you know, they would always have me on to talk about torture in Guantanamo and whatever. And, um, and then I went home and I saw the, 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 the actual segment that they did, and they had me talking about this alongside a simulated waterboarding, and it was very kind of lurid, and, and, and I said, that's it, I'm not, this is, you know, there's an agenda here that's separate from, you know, pure human rights, humanitarian concerns, so I won't do RT interviews. So I said to Nancy, nope, no RT, don't do it. And she said, no, we have to do RT, that's the one we must do. And I said, why? And she said, because yeah, Mohammed tell him why. She said, tell him she why. Said, she said, Mohammedu will see it. You know that, that that this is what they this is they they they, they won't. One of them, the few they won't that let they them show watch us. CNN. They won't let them watch Fox. They won't. But they do let them watch RT. So we went and we did this interview at <laughs> yes, RT. Yes, that's why. Yeah, that's yeah, why. yeah. It was crazy. I know you wouldn't understand. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's absolutely surreal. So surreal. I, I love Mohammed. I love what you said about we are our stories. That's an incredible thing. I, and I was thinking about the the man and the manuscript. The actual funny parallelism of those words, right? And, you know, the, the question, you know, that you were saying uh, um, that, you know, his book was held, you know, but it, it, it wasn't, it, it was he was held, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the book was his, one of his attempts to tell the story, but releasing him meant he would be able to tell the story anywhere, anytime, right? Like, and I think about... Like, like tonight. Like tonight. Yes. No. But I think about this. So let's, let, you know, in 2005 when Mohammedu wrote the manuscript, and the U.S. government knew not only that he shouldn't be there, but that the manuscript was a record of criminal activity, right, of a major human rights crime. But imagine if at that point the United States had said, okay, we're going to cut our losses here. We know he's, this is an innocent man. We're going to let him go. Mm -hmm. you know, I can tell you what would have happened in 2005, because at that point, the United States didn't even publicly release the names. The military didn't publicly release the names of the men who were imprisoned in Guantanamo until 2004. And they did it because the Associated Press went to court on a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit to get those names um, released. So that's how much we were, we were you know, just, like I say, extinguishing, negating the, 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 the lives of the men who were there, right? Mm -hmm. In 2005, if Mohamedou had been released, you know Mohamedou, look at, the, you see him, he speaks English, he would have been on CNN every time there was a Guantanamo story, there would have been somebody that they could go to, they could have called him and said, you know, what's, there's a hunger strike in Guantanamo. 2005, 2006, there were major hunger strikes. They would have called Mohamedou. Mohamedou, you know, they, he would have been on and he would have given that perspective. And suddenly, you know, the, 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 this, the, the detainees would have had a physical voice in the world. And so, you know, yes, his manuscript was locked up, but more importantly, he as the storyteller was locked up. So, you know, and, and, and even, even when they released the manuscript, you saw how censored it was, right? When I, when I was editing the manuscript, I had a lot of trouble with that, right? I thought, if I don't do my best to fill in the censorship, you know, to tell what's under those boxes, I'm failing in my role as his editor and, and as a free expression human rights advocate. You know, so my first job through was to try to make, I made those black boxes gray, and I would put in there, if I knew, if I knew just from reading it many times that the name that was redacted was actually the same interrogator who had appeared in chapter four, I would, I would note that, right? Or one of the weird things that they do is they, 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 they censored every single female pronoun she and her, so, you, so that you would not know that the interrogators who were actually sexually assaulting him, taking off their tops, molesting him, that somehow they were trying to, to, to hide the fact that these were women, not men. Well, it's obvious from the context, most of the point, but one of the, why were they doing that? Well, they were hiding the fact that the US military was, was abusing its own female enlistees and officers and forcing them to sexually assault the detainees, um, and they were instrumentalizing the, 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 the sex of their you know, soldiers as part of their attempts to, to torture their prisoners. 
So there are all these things. So I, I thought that's a, that's a major story. That's a huge, important story. You it know? is. So, so my, you know, my job is I cannot let that go without saying she, right? I know it's a she. It's obvious. You can count the number of letters that would fit in that space. It's not a he. It's one letter more. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, um, you know, um, and so I, I actually brought the, my, the editor the first time I brought this, you know, somewhat gray, the gray version of this, you know. Um, but as the more I thought about it, you know, there, there were complications to that. People could have gotten in trouble if I did that. It might have made Mohamedou's situation more difficult. Yeah. You know, that was, that was a consideration. But one thing changed my mind about it was that there was one line in, in it where Mohamedou says, he said, um, I could not help breaking down in, and the word is censored. And then the next sentence is something like, I don't know what's wrong with me these days, but it's just the slightest gesture of kindness will make me cry. That's uncensored. They censored the word tears. There is no other word that could have gone in that box, right? So I was asking myself, so why? Why would you do that? Why would you, you know, it's not, there's no national security aspect to the word tears, right? And suddenly I just had this picture of a person who had a job. They gave her this person a black pen You've met this person. You actually yes, met the met person who censored your book. Um, but they had, there was a person who sat there, probably several, you know, because it came in, in, in installments, as Mohammed said, you write 30 pages, put it in an envelope, they would send it off to the privilege facility, this guy would read it, right? You know, so they're going through and they're deciding when they're going to release it publicly, what are they going to censor? And I, I could see this person reading that and being so, so emotionally affected by that that their instinct was to cross it out. For some reason, that can't get out. You know, just the, that, 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 human, that human moment, you know. And the, the fact that that human moment was connected to kindness. It was a guard, who, a, a Puerto Rican guard. He's talking yes. about learning Spanish. Learning Spanish was, was a useful thing because many of Mohamedou's guards were Spanish speaking because this is the United States Army, right? So, but one of, one of and he writes beautifully about the, 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 the kindness of the Puerto Rican guard unit as compared to, to other guards. But the, the, the guard reached out and just touched him on the shoulder after all this isolation and said, don't worry, man, you're gonna go home. And, he, and, and Muhammad cried. And there was something about that scene that made this person whose job was to censor sensitive information just to go, well, can't have that in there. And then I realized, well, okay, Muhammad is still in prison. It, I can't, I can't in good, I can't, th 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 it has to be published this way because he's still being subject to this silencing and this violence. So we can't pretend that, we, you know, that he's being allowed to say these things or, 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 or say these things. And in fact, when you look at it, it's like the, the censorship is the, a character in the book. It's like the United States government you know, it has a hand in that book, just as they still had a hand in, <clears throat> in, in you know, Muhammadu's fate. So when Muhammadu got out, it, you know, I finally got to see him about three weeks after he was released. I got on a plane and flew to Mauritania. And the first thing he said to me is, you know, we're, we're doing an uncensored version. We're doing an uncensored version of the book. And, uh, and, and we ended up doing that. And, and, you know, we made the black boxes gray and, you know, and Muhammad would fill it in. And, you know, we, you can talk a little bit about that process, which was so fascinating about memory and, um, and all of those things. But, um, you know, that, that was the moment to do that. That was the moment to restore the manuscript, recreate the manuscript, because... But that's, that's what life would have been like for Mohamedou for those 10 years, right? He would have been out in the world. He could have told these stories. He would have been telling them. He would have been on the news all the time in the Arab-speaking Arab world, you know, in, 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 in Mauritania, you know, throughout, um, throughout the rest of the world, you know? These stories would have been known on, on this level. So they knew the moment he got out, they couldn't control that part of the story. And people would say to me, well, you know, how can he do that? It's like, well, how can, he, how, how can the US government stop him, right? He's home, he can speak. That's the, this, is what, this is what allowing him to go free meant, and this is why he didn't go free for all those years. So talk, talk, talk a little bit about the, doing the, the, the restored edition. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I just want to, uh, to address uh, all the Muslims in the world, because today is a very big day for Muslims, Arafah, and I wish them 
an accepted and meaningful Hajj, and tomorrow is also the biggest like uh, uh, holiday in the Islamic calendar. I just all of them who are here and the one who are following us online and will follow us. I want in the name of the Bali and all of us wish them a very happy Eid and a meaningful uh, Arafah. Uh, you know, uh, Yuri, like, you see this censorship is like when they call you to testify on your behalf in court. And then every time you say something they don't want, they stifle you. And then they let you talk, stifle you, let you talk, stifle you. So your testimony will not be meaningful to anyone because it's not complete. And, uh, and I, was, I felt very uh, violated, you know, in many ways, but that they uh, censored so much of my writing. You know, it's not like I wrote uh, Britannica. <laughs> you know, it's not an encyclopedia. It's, I think it's just like, it's not very long. And then they still like took so much out of it. And then I felt like obligated uh, toward my readers that I need to tell them what I think they took off because it's my memory and memory is not very reliable. And then we have just to guess and think and Larry and I we would, I would work day and night and I eat and then I, when I remember something, I write it. I, when I, eat, I remember something, I write. And then I share with Larry and then Larry also knows other documents because he read almost everything with the government. And one of the instances like that Larry always want to remember and you can tell them about this, uh, uh, you know, like uh, rectal feeding and so, because when I wrote about it, they did not know about it in America. So I think you should address that. Yeah. I, 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 the instance that you read in my book and you were taken aback by them. That, that's an amazing, amazing thing. I've, I, I've forgotten about that. So one of the, the, you know, one of the things about editing the book was, you know, that, that, that I discovered that even though I trusted Mohamedou completely as, you know, as a narrator of his own story, because I knew I had all these documents, right? And there's just like absolutely. That's, it, that's, that's so amazing that you, you knew that what he was writing was true. Because well, and it's just, it, there's a many, many, yeah. many amazing things about this yeah. book, but it's an, it, uh, one of them is that it's an incredible feat of memory. It's an incredible, incredible feat of memory. Um, Muhammadu was, uh, when, when he was a child, he was a hafez. He had, he had memorized the Quran. Um, and I've, I've met people who have said that that skill when, when in children, when they acquire that, the things that that does for your capacity to learn language, you know, because it's usually in your second language, um, and also to remember things, you know? Um, so it's not just that you're a genius. I just don't understand. <laughs> it's also the upbringing. It's also, yeah. yeah. But, 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 you know, but it is this incredible feat of memory because you could, you know, I mean, the, 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 the interrogators kept, the interrogation logs are minute by minute accounts of what happened to him. And they line up minute by minute with Mohammed's description of what happened to him. So I had no doubt that this story was true. But I had some doubts of Mo about Mohamedou as a writer, so let's say. I didn't know him. I knew he was an engineer. You know, he's writing in his... So I had some, I had some doubts about his literary narrative tools, and I had some doubts about his capacity in English. You know, and there, there are grammatical mistakes that you would expect and things like that. Um, and the narrative, the narrative thing was interesting because I, I spent about six months shaping the manuscript, because Mohammedu starts where he starts there, which is this rendition from, Bagra, from Jordan to Bagram, very dramatic, carries up through the present. And then, you know, then he, he goes back and he tells a little bit about what happened, sort of prequels to that. You know? So I had to figure out how to kind of refold this in there. Um, and then he does this thing that's what, uh, what literary critics and, and, and trauma um, uh, therapists will describe as traumatic writing, which is as the story gets more and more um, brutal, Mohamedou becomes a, more artful and securitous in how he tells that story. So, you know, instead of like when things get really intense, 
he breaks from the very linear storytelling at the beginning, and he'll have a section called guards, and he'll just profile a bunch of guards. And he just seems to be telling like personal stories about them or something. And then he has a story about interrogators, and then the stories about them. But you'll realize that in those stories, this story with this guard is the same as this scene with this interrogator. And so you know, in editing, you want to bring those together a little bit so that you can help that narrative, that, that linear narrative. So I spent about six months doing that. And then I spent the next six months undoing all of the mistakes that I made in that first six months. <laughs> but most, first it came from understanding that so much of the, that his narrative technique was entirely intentional and it was much better the way he had done it. So, you know, breaking linear storytelling was, you know, it wasn't just a literary choice. It was, a, it was an essential way of conveying that information emotionally that a linear way could not do. So that was, that was the first level of mistakes. And then the second level was the level of individual language. And there were two examples of that that I really remember vividly. The first one was Mohamedou describes, he had a friend in Canada. He bre lived briefly in Canada. And, and um, uh, you know, uh, every place that, you know, every country had this irrational crackdown on, on the Muslim communities. And, and so one of his friends at the time was in U.S. immigration prison in Florida. And they came to him with a picture. They're always interrogate every, everybody about everybody. They came with him with a picture of his friend who was in a prison jumpsuit in, in Florida. And Mohammedu wrote something like, Oh, uh, I, I can tell you, whenever you see somebody in one of those Calvin Klein, Bob Barker jumpsuits, I can tell you that's not a happy camper. And I was like, oh, that's Calvin Klein. I get that. That's kind of funny. Bob Barker, I don't really get that, because the Bob Barker I know is this weird American game show host, you know, who's like in his 70s, and he does his really tacky shows. And I thought, OK, Muhammad just like randomly reached for, you know, reached for a cultural reference and got it wrong. You know, and I was like, I, I should deal with that. And I completely forgot about that. I took, you know, so at one point I brought the manuscript to the editor publisher at, at, at Hachette. And we, he went through, we went through it really closely. And he goes, what's this, what's this, Calvin, what's this Bob Barker thing? And I was like, oh, God, I forgot. I, you know, I just kind of phoned it in. I just like, I forgot about that one. And he turns around and he Googles Bob Barker just at his computer. And it turns out Bob Barker is this guy in North Carolina, Bob Barker Incorporated, is the largest provider of prison jumpsuits and um, prison paraphernalia in the United States, which you can imagine, given the US prison system, is a huge industry, right? So everything in, in Guantanamo was branded Bob Barker. So the jumpsuits are Bob Barker, the, the, the shower slippers are Bob Barker, the toothbrushes are Bob Barker. So it's just, uh, so Muhammad is just, uh, uh, once again, completely, faithfully, accurately telling, telling the truth, right? So there, I kept having instances like that where I would have to go back and go, oh, he knows what he's talking about. The one that, the one that he's referring to is he, there's this, that while he's being tortured, um, there's a scene where the guards say, say to him, you know, if you don't, if you don't cooperate, we're going to feed you, we're going to feed you up to your ass. That's what he says. And I'm like, all right, I know America. I know these guys. I know these guards, right? I grew up with guys who went into the army. I know, you know, I know them now. You know, I can see American tough guys saying, you know, we're going to kick your ass. We're going to, you know, we're going to feed you up to. I, I thought, well, what does that mean? We're just going to feed you, uh, force feed you so much it's like, you know, till your half, you know, half of your body is force fed or something. I don't know. I couldn't quite figure out. Couldn't quite grasp it. You know, but I like, okay, I'm, well, I think he means not up to your ass, but up your ass. I could see them saying that. We're going to feed you up your ass. But it's just, just a kind of tough guy threat, right? So that's, you know, it came out as, you know, we're going to feed you up your ass. And that's the way it was published. And it was published in 2015. In 2017, the United States Senate released a report uh, about, um, that documented the, the, the abuse, the torture of men in the CIA black sites you know, in, in Poland and Lithuania and, and Thailand and, and other places. And one of the things that, um, that we did to one man in particular was what they called rectal feeding, which is force feeding um, through a tube um, up their rectum, which has no nutritional value at all. It's just, it's essentially rape, you know, is what it is. But it was a thing. It was a thing. I never in my wildest dreams could I have imagined that 
that was something that we were doing to people. You know, so I, I, when that went to print, I still didn't understand the depth of truth of what he was saying. And this was, you know, this, these, uh, these techniques m migrated from the CIA you know, um, sites into Guantanamo. These guards had probably gone to a training session. They were serious. You know, this could have happened. So, you know, this was like, I, I, of course, I couldn't talk to Mohammed. I couldn't ask these questions, you know. So it's just this constant process of discovering that what Mohammed said and how he said it, you know, was like, I should get the hell out of the way. You know, my job was to be a transparent window here as much as possible. And, um, you know, and, and I think this will continue to happen for many years is that this book will reveal truths that I still don't understand. I'll, I'll tell you one more story about that, just about the way the storytelling worked for me. So I'd been doing human rights work for 25 years at this point, you know, and, and um, I was kind of wondered about myself because I would have very difficult days, you know, but even in my most difficult days in dealing with, you know, families or people who had been too terrible things, I always had this ability to kind of go home and have a beer and watch the baseball game and go to sleep, right? And then I'd get up the next day and, you know, I was like, I could really separate these things, you know? And about four or five months into editing this manuscript, I started having really horrific nightmares. Just one night out of nowhere of intense, grotesque violence. And I was the agent of violence. I was, I was doing unspeakable things to people. And it happened one night. And I woke up and I was just freaked out. Never had I had anything like that. And then I went to sleep the next night and I woke up in the same thing. And it went on for like three nights, four nights. And I was really starting to worry about myself. I just like, you know, and, and I, I said to my partner, who's a therapist and social worker, you know, I said, I'm having these unbelievable violent dreams. I don't know what's going on. And she looked at me and she's like, I, I made, my desk was in the corner of the bedroom and the manuscript was there and my notes and everything. She looked at me and she looked at the desk and she looked at me and she said, you don't know what's going on? Are you an idiot? You know, but this was like I had done, I had had encounters with stories of trauma my whole life, you know, but somehow the way Mohamedou writes this story, his strategies, which include humor, you know, which include this incredible empathy, which, you know, this incredible ability to, you know, to, 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 present these people who are doing unspeakable things as, as, as humane and interesting and human people. Funny people sometimes, um, sad people other times. Somehow that broke through it for me, and I just I, I, I felt I felt the truth of I felt the the level of violence in a way that I'd never experienced with anything before. Thank you for um, this tribute to the literary quality of your writing, um, and you're absolutely right. It's um, in many ways gripping, and also the literary aspect of it. And thank you for sharing a very personal uh, uh, memory of the, uh, of the or experience. Um, the Bob Barker, yeah. I mean, imagine. I mean, it, 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 those details are pointing to many other things. I mean, imagine that you're happy to make your money, and yet so proud, so proud about it that you print your name on all the horrible things. I mean, all the assets used in a camp like one. I mean. That alone. <laughs> yeah, I would. I would never have imagined anybody would be personally no, branding. No, you would, you would not have your name on yeah, it, wouldn't exactly. you? Exactly. <laughs> but no, no. but that no no the world is different and yeah. uh, um, uh, and then the black sides and how you know uh, things practices get out of those places. I think there's the right moment to listen to Jochen ten Haaf again uh, about yeah. the quality of the manuscript. Um, Jochen, can I ask you for another another piece? Right. Yeah. And so the brothers keep on going on hunger strike for the same old and new reasons. And there seems to be no solution in the air. The government expects the US forces in Guantanamo to pull magic solutions out of their sleeves. But the US forces in Guantanamo understand the situation here more than any, than any bureaucrats in Washington DC. And they know that the only solution is for the government to be forthcoming and release people. But what do the American people think? I'm eager to know. 
I would like to believe the majority of Americans want to see justice done, and they are not interested in financing the, det the detention of innocent people. I know there is a small extremist majority that believes that everybody in this Cuban prison is evil, and that we are treated better than we actually deserve. But this opinion has no basis but ignorance. I am amazed that somebody can build such an incriminating opinion about people he or she doesn't even know. Imagine this is written in 2005, approximately, probably, just after you've been tortured for a year. And the fact that you realize that you know, just a few people would um, endorse that or would think that you're treated even too good, you know? which I think is a testimony to what you just explained so, so well um, about the manuscript, about the book, how it actually appeals to the humanity of the reader. Um, Mohammed, are you... Um, you're out of prison for six years now, is that right? Five years. Five, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you wrote this by now quite a while ago, but you managed to keep that, um, that very special humani humanity inside yourself alive, even after you came out of prison. Um, because, the book is very much about forgiveness. Uh, it's about horrible things. We haven't read out you know, the most horrible scenes in it. There's, there's terrible things in it. But it is about forgiveness, which is um, thinking that you wrote this you know, on two-sided paper because there was no paper in it. You know, um, it's a probably too difficult question, but how on earth are you able to do that? You know, uh, thank you, Yuri, for this uh, question. Uh, you know, I really cannot repeat enough that, you know, I really forgive everybody who ever, you know, inflict any pain on me. And I know people receive this differently. They say, like, Oh, you just want to promote yourself, which is true, actually. <laughs> and you really don't mean it, which is not true. I really mean it. And this is a way for me to free myself, because I don't believe that prison is just like a box, you know, that could be imposed physically, but we could also, the worst boxes are the box we imprison ourselves in like hate. If you are a hateful person, you are in prison and there is no one who is going to save you because you just live in pain and suffering. If you have resentment, you know, you are in prison. And uh, I, to be honest, you know, I have this secret practice, you know, when I go to my bedroom, I watch like extremists in my part of the world, and I laugh a lot. And I watch fascists in this part of the world. That is just their obsession, you know, with hate. And hatred is just so funny to me because they're really in pain. And I know I'm not in pain because whatever they say about people like me, uh, it does not bother me at all. Because I know in my heart I don't hate them and I don't hate anyone, and I don't think that anyone with knowledge and with education would be able to hate anyone or to imprison themselves. And why it's easier for someone in my situation to forgive, I think this is like very tragic that we only know what matters when we face death. This is really, we will never know what matters to us before we face death. Like Larry would never know really what matters in his life, except the moment. I faced death many times in prison, you know. I remember when Staff Sergeant Charlie came to me 
And he brought my file. And he was explaining to me that I was going to be killed. You know, I was the first like death penalty case. And he's going to the details of it, you know, it's just so, it's just so eerie, you know. And I made peace that I would never, ever see my family again, never see life again, you know. It's so, so much pain. But at that moment, he was like talking, you know, but I was not listening to him. I just wanted him to finish and I want to go back to myself so I could live in my fantasy world that I created in my head. And uh, so this second chance that I have is what really makes me very happy because I'm, I'm enjoying my second chance and I'm not like my happiness, I'm not going to postpone it for tomorrow. I'm going to be happy today. You know, and I'm not going to wait, just like a child, you know, and without forgiveness, because forgiveness is the one that gives me like peace and serenity. It's not easy to be honest to you. Sometimes I just want to say, oh, that bitch, you know, or, <laughs> I, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine, yeah. Yes, yeah, I really. I really can. <laughs> and I swear, I swear to to you, uh, Yuri, sometime on Facebook, I want to have two persons. <laughs> Me and the bitch. <laughs> because sometime I really want to answer the people who say so many bad things about innocent people, about minorities, you know. And I just want to tell them something because I have very sharp tongue. Guys, you don't know me. <laughs> you know, I got beaten up in school because I have sharp tongue and I could not back it up with my body. <laughs> so, and uh, so this is like, you know, just, but I use the other bad guy in me who can respond to everybody in art and in writing and in comedy, you know, because art, is my other bad guy because I can say anything in art and no one is going to hold me accountable, you know? <laughs> in my comedy, in, in my writing, he, he's read, reading what I'm writing. And uh, yeah. So I just hope, I, I, all I'm saying is that being a bad person, being a good forgiving person is easier than being bad. And I'm a lazy person, and I always take the <laughs> the short, uh, the short, the shortcut. Yes. The, the road is of less resistance. Yes, absolutely. That's <laughs> me. <laughs> ah, yeah. Um, I, I just you, I want to say, uh, just uh, say one thing, uh, although I, I I'm reluctant to say anything after that. But I I do I, so I've thought a lot about this. You know, and had this conversation a lot with Mohamedou. Um, because my first reaction was, yeah, come on, that's clever, but really seriously. And then I, then I really deeply it's understood. It's true. Yeah. You never believed me. Yeah, no, I, I said, oh, come on. <laughs> like he did, he did an interview when he landed in Mauritania, and he said, I forgive everyone. And so when I saw him a couple weeks later, I said, nice move. That was really smart, you know? Like, but seriously. Smart way of p doing PR. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I was like, really, <laughs> yeah. that's really good. You know, but you, you must really be angry, you know? And he's like, then, then I learned that this the way in which forgiveness is self-liberation, right? And it's, it's absolutely, I've seen it, I've seen it, I, I understand it. But I wanna really make an important point here, is that his forgiveness, I'm gonna say of me, you know, let's say of my country, of my, you know, me representing my country, doesn't absolve me or my country of the responsibility of accounting for and correcting and apologizing for and repairing those crimes. And I think that's, you know, that's so important because Mohamedou has freed himself. We have not freed ourselves. You know, torture is something that is devastating for the person who's tortured and for the, the torturers. It um, crushes the humanity of both of them. And a lot of what's happening in the United States now, um, a lot of the crisis in the United States, and it is an enormous and deep crisis in the United States, um, has, has something to do with the problem of impunity and the lack of accountability and the inability to um, process and apologize for past mistakes, um, to confront them and to make them right. Um, and so, 
you know, there's an, a remarkable documentary um, by a German filmmaker that's out now um, that includes scenes in which Mohamedou meets with, via, via video, some of his guards and interrogators. And it's a devastating portrait of how damaged these men and women are from this. And so, you know, that we, there, there's forgiveness for Muhammadu, which is liberating, and, and it's, it's an incredible, beautiful thing, uh, and a life lesson that I would never have known before. Uh, but I know that it's a lesson that has not been practiced on our side, um, and, and there's, a, there's so much work to be done. Um, uh, and and there, not doing that work on our side is having devastating consequences for the people involved and for the whole country. So, I think that's very true. I think um, I read through the torture report you put together. Um, and I, I have to stress, uh, I wasn't going to, but I think I have to st stress again that um, it's people like you who in early stages uh, take the, the pain of writing down the, the labor, the, 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 the work, the many years to write down the misdoings of our governments, and um, uh, by that I would say um, keep rule of law and democracy alive, uh, although um, it's not always um, uh, appreciated and heard. But I think you're a true dissident in the best sense of the word, that you already for years you know, wrote down those, those things and those um, horrible practices. Uh, would have, it would have been good for us to have listened to it, because it's damaging our democracy and damaging our rule of law, and it's damaging the way we think uh, we should have a society with functions. So um, uh, it's, very, it's very important work, and um, <laughs> uh, uh, well, um, I, I, I leave it at that for the moment, um, because um, uh, there could be many more. We could say many, many more things. We could, you know, this is already the um, uh, uh, the fourth time I've been talking to you uh, in different settings. Uh, we've been talking for more than a year, first online and then uh, in several uh, moments here in this hall. We will be doing that again. We will be doing that, uh, among others, with um, um, with um, uh, Nancy Hollander. Uh, we've been doing that with um, uh, Kevin McDonald, the maker of uh, the monumental film, uh, The Mauritanian, about your life. And um, thank you for talking about the book. Um, I, I thank you, the audience, for uh, uh, coming here. I hope to uh, see you again. I have to thank both of you for an uh, uh, amazing um, conversation, for sharing your uh, thoughts and wisdom, um, and for your work um, in the past years, for uh, explaining again, you know, going through Guantanamo again for us tonight. Uh, it's an amazing um, uh, uh, tour de force. How do you say that? It's it's a must be um, tour de force. Yeah. Um, we there's so much more we could have talked about. So you could watch uh, the evening we did with um, uh, Kevin McDonald about the film. Um, you might want to come to Nancy Hollander or to one of the evenings after that with one of the guards. Um, it's important, I think, to say, because we didn't really say so, that um, after 14 years, Mohamedou was sent back to Mauritania without being charged, without being um, uh, um, indicted, without being convicted, and without a, an apology. And I think uh, that is important to say um, after you've been tortured and held uh, for 15 years. Um, we leave it at that. We can drink something at the bar if you like and uh, hope to see you back. Thank you, Larry. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you all. Thank you, my brother. Thank you so much.